Welcome back to the Meantime Show featuring Lenny. Uh, it is week 10 of the NFL season. Goodness. And I am joined to preview every week 10 game this week by my friend, the host of the Fantasy Focus Football Podcast and First Draft, so multiple podcasts uh, under his belt right now. Field Yates, welcome to the show. Mina, it's great to be on with you. Uh, I had the same reaction when I realized it was week 10 to what I think you were just suggesting, which is where has the season gone? But here we are over halfway, uh, at least to the regular season, or we at the halfway point of the regular season, I should say. Uh, and it makes it feel like every game that we have to preview right now has a little bit more stakes than usual. Some of them, I, I feel like there's a few games on here where it, it feels like if they lose, it's over. And sure. that might be true of Thursday night football when it comes to the Cincinnati yeah. Bengals, who are obviously um, with their start to the season, every game matters a great deal for them. Um, and as always, we're going to talk about every game. We're going to talk about some games in greater depth than others. This is one of those games because this is a very good game. Uh, the last time these teams played this year, it was a 41 to 38 shootout. Uh, you could make a case, and I know there's going to be Bills fans listening to this who are shaking their fists, but I really do think you can make a case that there are no two quarterbacks in the NFL right now playing better than the two quarterbacks who are playing in this football game. Yeah, Joe Burrow now has two games this season with five passing touchdowns. I don't think anybody in the NFL besides him has even, I guess it's just one for the rest of the NFL combined, which was Lamar himself. So the two quarterbacks in this game, it has been a ridiculous run for Joe Burrow. Uh, I know that others have said this, but I'll just join the parade in saying that, you know, Joe's play this season has perhaps got to have been a bit under discussed just because yeah. this team has not won nearly as many football games as we would have expected. And what's so surprising about Cincinnati's start record-wise is that if you looked at the schedule in May, you would have thought to yourself, an opportunity for like a real push early on in the season was in play. And then they lose week one to the Patriots, a team that, as you and I talk right now, is tied for the worst record in the NFL. And that, that feels about right when you watch them week in and week out, other than Drake May. And you're thinking to yourself, how did Cincinnati lose to them? But they have had this margin for error early in the season for like four straight years that hasn't yet allowed them to become snake bitten. They found their way into the playoffs and had some serious success. This year feels much more perilous, despite the brilliance of Joe Burrow, who has not been just great this entire season, but was unstoppable against the Ravens when these two teams played a while ago with those five passing touchdowns I mentioned. I mean, they, they, he went nuclear on the, they, yeah. they both went nuclear. It was, again, like I say, they're the best quarterbacks this season, arguably, put Allen into the mix too, but they're, they're the unbelievable in that particular game. Um, I kind of expect more of the same in this one in terms of offense. So as always... We're each taking one side of the ball uh, and talking about a key for victory for each of those teams. Uh, you're on the Bengals because okay. they're the away team. I, I'm on Baltimore, so I'll go first here. Um, for me, again, I, I kind of went back and just looked at everything they did on offense because, you know, it's the same. It's a re That's the nice thing about when we start having these uh, rematches is you can just start thinking about what worked and what didn't. A lot worked the last time these teams played. I mean, they dominated them when they had multiple tight ends on the field. They had a 57% success rate. Charlie Kolar caught a bunch of deep balls. Take I remember Andrews. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Mark Andrews is, I think, kind of more back now than he was then. So uh, the Bengals defense has been awful against 12 personnel. I wouldn't be surprised if they do that. They ran the ball. Uh, uh, 6.1 yards per carry for Derrick Henry, 60% success rate. That's where I'm focused. I think I, there's a number of things that the Bengals defense does poorly that Baltimore can exploit. But the run defense, it, it, it jumps out to me as being one of the singular biggest mismatches in this game versus the best rushing attack in football. And I did want to highlight something that I thought was interesting about the Ravens' run game. With Derrick Henry this year, Field, uh, they're running it under center at a much higher clip. Uh, in fact, they are now under center with their backs, not Lamar. 58% uh, of the time, that compares to 33% last year, which is a massive wow. change. Uh, and when they do so, they average 5.6 yards per carry. I bring that up because while they are very good at running under center, they're very good at running uh, under the gun. Uh, I did notice an interesting split for the Bengals defense. So versus gun runs, the Bengals defense has actually not been that bad. They're 10th hmm. in EPA per play, 15th in success rate. Versus under center runs, they are dead last. Dead last in EPA ever yeah. play, dead last in success rate. They simply cannot stop them. So if I'm Baltimore, I go I go to the well on that one. Uh, a lot of those under the center, uh, under center runs, I should say, in general, are 
runs that are going to attack between the tackles and Bengals have been really, really shorthanded at the defensive tackle all season. So maybe not a total surprise there. Uh, this is a tough, I mean, they're a tough matchup for everybody. This feels like a particularly tough matchup for Cincinnati. I think the way that they win this game is by merely outscoring Baltimore, but they yeah. have to get up the field better on third down this time than the last time that they played. They were t- uh, the Ravens were 10 for 15 on third downs last year. Like going two out of three is just bad defense in general, but to have 15 separate third down opportunities and fail to get them off the field on 10 separate occasions speaks to the problems that this team has defensively. I think the hard part about Baltimore and watching them, it's not that they necessarily have a singular player amongst their pass catchers who a team is like fearful of to the point that they are like designing their entire game plan around them. There's no Justin Jefferson or Jamar Chase within this offense, but they have like, and I feel like I'm speaking to my nearly three-year-old right now, like a lot of different shapes and sizes on offense does Baltimore, right? Like, I don't know that Isaiah likely will play on Thursday night. Sounds like he's probably trending towards not playing, but between the wide receivers, you've got like pint size Zay Flowers, who can also stretch the field despite being like 5'9". Deontay Johnson, we'll see what kind of role he plays on Thursday night, right? Whatever you want to say about the beginning of Rashad Bateman's career, the guy's been a field stretcher this year and has been a big player for this Baltimore offense. Then you've got three tight ends who make meaningful contributions as well. And while this guy is very much the undercard of the running back room, like Justice Hill like will impact the passing game too. So Cincinnati does not have a ton of answers for all of the weapons that Baltimore throws their way. But the fact that Baltimore has allowed 281 passing yards a game this season, which is worse by a lot in the NFL, gives them some reasons for hope. And I acknowledge that part of the reason why Baltimore is allowing a ton of passing yards is they are often playing with massive, massive leads. But Cincinnati has the horses and they have been amongst the pass heaviest teams in the NFL since Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow have been paired up. That should be the strategy in Thursday night. Just lean into that and see if you can win this game almost like you did last time, just this time being the 41 as opposed to the 38. A one notable difference. I do believe T. Higgins is not playing, right? Last I saw it was was looking dubious. So the last time these teams played, um, I mean, it was insane. Uh, Jamar Chase had uh, 10 catches and T. Higgins had nine. So that's obviously both, you know, I mean, Jamar Chase was 9.1 uh, errors per target T Higgins was 10.1 it was like a fireworks show right and yep. taking T Higgins off the table it, it that makes things a lot easier for a Baltimore pass defense that has obviously struggled all season long um I do want to want do one quick nod I did like the Bengals I didn't talk about this on Tuesday it was kind of a quieter trade I did like the Bengals adding Khalil Herbert yeah. um, obviously they needed back depth and um one thing I would be interested in seeing is how they use him as a pass catcher that's kind of an element that has been missing in this offense and if Baltimore plays some of that, you know, shell coverage against Joe Burrow, having, I don't know, again, we, with these trades, you never know how active these guys will be, right. but having him as a check down either in this game or in the future really helps that offense. Yeah, it's a meaningful trade if they win on Thursday night. And it, it still is, if, even if they don't, but um, check this out. This season, prior to Zach Moss getting hurt this last Friday, Zach Moss and Chase Brown accounted for 100% of the offensive snaps from Bengals running backs. Every single Bengal snap amongst for, for a running back and before last week was Zach Moss or Chase Brown. Mm-hmm. Chase Brown, who is not the biggest running back you'll see, handled 100% of the running back carries in week nine. They desperately need a second running back because they have zero trust in Travion Williams uh, and really any depth running back, basically any running back not named Chase Brown right now that is healthy. So that cleared Herbert. Uh, Kendall Milton was the other back that they promoted from the practice squad last week. But uh, Khalil Herbert could be like not just a factor for them, but playing like 45 or 50 percent of the snaps as soon as I think week 10, week 11, uh, probably not in week 10, just with like zero practices or one practice underneath his belt. But he'll play a lot for them going forward. He's a good player. I yeah, always liked him in Chicago. Um, yeah. That said, I am taking the Ravens in Same. this one. Yeah, I no Higgins is really that because like I, I'm in total agreement with you. I think it has to be another very high scoring game for Cincinnati to win and just not having him really hurts them in that regard. Um, okay. So the next game is just yours to just, uh, give a key. And that is a, a riveting Giants Panthers game in Germany. What did the people of, well, uh, yeah. Germany, uh, yeah, we don't have to get into history, but Germany um, is, well, this is this is your game, guys. Giants yeah. Panthers. It's gonna be Bryce Young, by the way. Yeah. That's what you want to talk about. 
Yeah, you know, we've we've been through a stretch uh, during the pandemic where like we had to take what we could get as far as like sports consumption was concerned. That's like, you know, that's the message this week. Like, you know, a game featuring these two teams is a game that's not at all taking place. Um, so we do know it's Bryce Young. And I think that this is going to be like a, re- a relatively like straightforward observation for me about how this game is won. It's do the Panthers pass protect better than the Giants pass rush or do the Giants pass rush better than the Panthers pass protect? The Giants in their two games, and they've been a really, really solid pass rush for much of this season, but they have been at their absolute best in their two wins. They had eight sacks and then seven sacks, unfortunately, against your Seahawks uh, in their most recent win. That's 15 sacks and two wins. Uh, they have not been nearly as productive in their seven losses. And then for the Panthers, in their two wins, they've allowed a total of three sacks. And I know that sacks are bad in general, but as you know, like I think sack yardage is also a part of the equation here. Like there's a difference between a good sack and a catastrophic sack. Three total sacks with 18 total sack yards taken for the Panthers in their two games that they have won this season. If they're keeping the quarterback clean, in this case, it'll be Bryce Young, and he's playing on time, which is something he did not do in the first two weeks of the season. Way too much of holding onto the football and, frankly, looking skittish. He's looked much more confident uh, since taking back over as the starting quarterback. We'll see whether he remains in that capacity, but this is going to be a line of scrimmage game. These two teams have like good, solid running backs each. They've got some unique players but i think this comes down to you know pass rush versus pass protection whichever of those two sides prevails probably gets the win for me and i think that panthers run game can help bryce young because yeah. this giants run defense the giants pass rush is very good the run defense no. is not right no good no and good. um tuba hubbard has had some big games this year and i actually think they've actually blocked for him decently well yeah. up front so it's you can see a world in which they get the ball going on the ground. Bryce hits on some of the play action throws we saw last week. I, I was watching that game this morning when we texted. <laughs> Jatavian Sanders thoughts, I, everybody. My brain's got to go somewhere, know, so it's, I'm going to watch Bryce Young. And I will yeah. say, I agree with your assessment. Like He looked so much more comfortable. Some anticipatory throws. There were some good throws that were dropped in that. Yeah. So, look, the Saints defense is also very, very, very bad, but it's not like the Giants defense is much better. So... This could be actually surprisingly interesting game on that yeah. side of the ball. Last thing I'll say on this game is red zone. Uh, the Giants get there a little bit more than the Panthers do, but the Giants are a terrible team in the red zone. They are dead last in touchdown percentage in the red zone. The Panthers aren't bad when they get there. They just don't get there a whole lot. Eighth best touchdown red zone percentage. So uh, it's about converting. You know, we, we see these teams that uh, are, you know, sort of death by, you know, the, the Vikings have kind of become this. The Colts actually this past Sunday night, Colts and Vikings, two very good red zone defenses that uh, have been at least of late, not quite as dominant uh, in between the 20s. But, uh, you know, the proverbial scoring zone has when they have been at their best. Uh, that has not been the case for the Giants offense so far this season. Patriots Bears. We're actually talking about and I just, I, this. I don't know why I decided we both had to hit both sides of this one, but the, you know we got the, the yeah, number exciting. one and number yeah. three overall pick quarterback. And Two earlier stats. this week, yeah, uh, Dominique and I named Drake May as one of our winners of the week. We were really impressed what we saw. I'm on the Bears side though, and this was hard for me because I, you know, the Bears defense I could hit that, but I wanted to focus on the offense because I haven't talked about them at all, and I was really struggling to pick one thing that they had to do better because they're bad at everything right now. And the difficult part is there's not a single culprit, right? Like they're not pass protecting well, but Caleb is making it worse. He invites pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, The concepts, I like the past concepts to me, like guys aren't open a lot of the time. Some of them don't really make sense. They're not running the football well either. I thought they would be much better. And so I, 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 it, I mean, it's really the Williams play under pressure is the worst part here, right? When you look at the numbers, and but the problem is again, there's not a single reason for that. Some of it is him, some of it's offensive line, some of it is the offense. I just wrote Caleb, just check it down, man. Just check it down. He has the lowest check down rate in the entire NFL right now per uh, FTN Fantasy, and wow. that. Uh, correlates with what you see on that's, tape. that's college that's college caleb too right that yeah. was the big thing is that not every play has to be a home run and um I, he said he has such a bright future heck there's even been some great stuff this season i think yeah. some of this his his we, if you were to do like a a draft of the best throws of the season like you might have a couple of caleb throws that go really early on in the rounds uh, but he just needs to take some pressure off of himself because uh, while the offensive line has not been good enough there are weapons there 
like that they can yeah. deploy consistently and it can make life a whole lot easier on Caleb. And by right. the way, that stands in stark contrast to the Patriots. Um, I think you and I are both like yeah. on the team of like, you know, sometimes it becomes a bit reductive to just say like run the football and like that'll like cure your offensive woes. However, with the Patriots, like it actually feels like, and this might be a real reason for encouragement in the long term for the Patriots. It feels like right now their best offensive play is Drake May on second reaction opportunities, 100%. whether it's scrambles or whether it's making something out of nothing and just uncorking a deep ball or even an intermediate throw because he has such a ridiculous arm. That's kind of their best play right now because when you're playing on time and in rhythm in this Patriots offense, they just don't generate any separation right now amongst their wide receivers. They have a really limited group and probably their best wide receiver is Pop Douglas, but he's like a, like size deficiencies, right? Like this is not, it's, it's like a conventional, like, you know, joystick slot receiver. It's not like a perimeter number one alpha. So I think running the football with a little bit more confidence, uh, Ramondre Stevenson has been incredibly busy, Mina, but he hasn't run for more than 2.6 yards per carry in any of their past three games. Mm -hmm. So again, I, again, I don't want to sound like, you know, old man from the clouds yelling at, you know, the, the people that think that football uh, needs to be set backwards or something, but uh, a little bit of balance and go, it was just like create a slightly like the defenses just are just putting the top on the Patriots offense so easily right now that uh, they're kind of relying on Drake May to play hero ball to get anything done. It's, it's worked at an impressive rate, most notably on that final play of regulation last week, but they got to find some level of a running game because the passing attack just offers no threat whatsoever. Drake May should not have 40 plus dropbacks every week. It's just yeah. like unsustainable, but they're doing that because they can't run the ball. I think the, the way the run game looks is something that's caught my eye. Um, I feel like now it's year two of them trying to run outside zone and it mostly failing. Honestly, Alex Van Pelt is their offensive coordinator. To me, it looks a lot better when they get downhill. Um, so they got to figure that out too. I agree with you, uh, especially against, you know, a Bears defense that, I mean, I think we would agree is the best unit of the four in this totally. game. Totally, yeah. Um, it's why I'm picking the Bears. By the way, I skipped the previous one. I'm taking the... Oh, I forgot uh, to. Sorry, yeah. I'm supposed to remind you, dang. Um, I'll take the Giants on, on Sunday. In, I'm also in taking the Giants. I don't I mean, we're three for three. Because pick, of what you described, which is yeah. that mismatch in the trenches. I also think yeah. this Panthers defense can't stop the run. I think Tyrone Dracy has a big day. Yeah. Um, and this one, I'm taking the Bears. So just to kind of go back to what I was saying, the defense, their defense, I, I know that, you know, I, I don't know what the deal is with Mo Kyler Gordon and Montez Sweat right now. I saw they were limited in practice. And you really, I thought that their absence was pretty stark. Yeah. Um, Juan Brisker, I'd argue too, their starting safety has been out for like almost a month with the concussion. Yeah, um, that one's scary, yeah. Yeah, it is scary. I'll pick the the, the Bears as well. You know, they, they're a better team. They're playing at home. They're they're four and zero in home games this year. Now, one of those was played across the pond, but you know, three and zero in games in Chicago this season. I don't know if that's small sample size issue or if they're legitimately more comfortable and better playing at home. They're a more talented team. They should be the more desperate team because if they lose, like season's yeah. over and the pressure yeah. ramps up a lot on a lot of people, you know, uh, in Chicago. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, they, this roster is too good to be, yeah. you know, to, to, to fumble this, this frequently in key situations. The, the number of self-inflicted wounds has been obviously a real problem over the past few weeks. Uh, they need to win on Sunday, but do so in orderly fashion as well. Like they need to come out there, take a convincing lead early, run the football effectively against a bad Patriots run defense, like do the things that like good teams do to bad teams. And I think a lot of, the tension that probably has mounted over the past couple of games will at least temporarily subside because they go into a brutal stretch down this uh, down uh, brutal schedule down the stretch. They play all of their division games from week eleven on, so it's basically Lions, Packers, Vikings, wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah, the vibes are not good in Chicago right now. Oh, all the stories yeah. coming out, the you know DJ Moore thing. I mean, it. Uh, they need this win for they sure. Do. Um, okay. Niners Bucks uh, is next, and you are talking about the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. So for the 49ers, and you could, I don't want to take a, a key away from you, um, but you can make the case that like you could apply the same key to the other side of the ball. Uh, but for the 49ers, so with no Mike Evans and no Chris Godwin, we've seen the Tampa Bay Buccaneers game, uh, pass game evolve a little bit. Yeah. And it really hasn't been the wide receivers picking up the, the slack here. It's become the K. Dotton and running backs it's show. Fun, and you, you could yeah. really argue that the, you know, I think it's a pretty easy argument that the best coverage linebacker, or at least the best linebacker in football, is 
Fred Warner, and he's as adept as handling pass game duties as any linebacker. Um, and they're going to need that on Sunday because Baker Mayfield has continued to hum over the past couple of games, maybe not quite at the same level, but certainly given him a shot to win over the past couple of games. So the 49ers defensively need to have an answer for the running backs in the passing game. Rashad White's been a much more effective runner this year than he was last season. But I do think the way in which Tampa keeps this game competitive is by sort of playing keep up with San Francisco. They're not going to shut them down with their porous defense and San Francisco's very explosive offense. So for San Francisco, it's finding a way to mitigate the impact of those three guys in the passing game. Kate Otten, Bucky Irving, and also Rashad White, who have each stepped up in a major way over the past couple of weeks, uh, perhaps none more so than Otten, who all of a sudden is like, I don't know, one of the five most impactful tight ends in the entire NFL. He has been a beast for them, obviously, really former UW great, duh. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great point. I, I, I'm, I would start by saying I share your assessment that the key is for both sides on that side of the ball because I just don't think that this Bucks defense is well matched against him, especially if I mean, we should Christian McCaffrey's back, I know, right? Yeah. And the lead, that's, probably, that's, right? That's a nightmare for this Bucks defense oh, that can't stop the run. The linebackers in Tampa are a liability in coverage this year. You know, I, I can't. Whenever Levante David gives up a pass, I have to cover my eyes because he's my know. he's my go. He's but guy. yeah, it's tough right now. Um, so yeah, I, I, to your point, I, they got to keep up. And, but guess what? You just kept up with kept up with the Chiefs, yeah. who have a better defense than right. San Francisco. You have yeah. proof of concept. Like I, I, I was so disappointed by the Bucks' loss, and Dominique and I talked about this on Monday because the Bucks' offense was so good in that game in the second half. And I was so impressed by them and impressed by Baker and impressed by Liam Cohen. So for them to, you know, not believe in them at the last second, the way they did, it was, it was, it was depressing because of what <laughs> they have done without those receivers. I mean, I just want to give Mayfield his flowers. He's been really good under pressure this year. At the beginning of the season, I was like, well, Baker Mayfield's not very good under pressure. That's not been the case this year. When the ball comes out quick, he has been accurate and decisive. He has been a timely scrambler, which is very important against San Francisco because they give up the second most EPA per carry on quarterback runs in the entire NFL, yeah. by the way. So career year right now for Baker. He's on track to like double his best rushing season ever. He loves scrambling too. You can he tell he, he, like, yeah, he, he just, one of those quarterbacks he like is like. Yeah. Um the other thing, so I I like your point about that uh the passing game flowing through the the backs and the tight ends. The other thing I'll say is like this Tampa Bay run game has been much, much better this year. Yeah. Especially as they have evolved into using more Irving and whatnot. I think for against the San Francisco 49ers defense, that's much better against the pass than the run. You got to run the ball. You got to run the ball outside the pat tackles. They run a lot of outside zone uh, in Tampa. Um, you got to stretch them horizontally rather than just going north south. They have struggled against that all year long. Um, if they do that, if they if the pass game can just remain efficient as opposed to explosive, mm -hmm. then I think they can stay in this one. Um, I, I it's it's going to be. They, they remind me, by the way, the Bucks remind me. Uh, they're like the they're, they're the fantasy team that's four and five, but like fourth in fantasy points scored, right? Like you're like, yeah. I know we're better than our record says. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about my war room league team this year, but that's it's a not different my conversation. Team sucks. Different. <laughs> I guess it's okay. Kevin Lass. Oh. Uh, yeah, you know what? You you came out red hot. Was it your first league, first year in the league? You won the entire thing. So um, I don't see that. That's like a ten year grace period. Who cares about the following ten years? You got your championship. Ugh. I had yeah. Puka. Puka was my first. I know. Pick. God, I know. Um, I'm taking San Francisco in this one. Yeah, San Francisco. I am very interested in seeing what Christian McCaffrey looks like. Dang, right? we because, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that's, you yeah, know, we're four for four now, right? I don't like that. Yeah. It's that time of year. Yeah. Well, CNC in the passing game will be a big factor. We have gotten nothing from the back so far in the passing game this season, and CMC, yeah. yeah. Massive, Duh. Massive, but, you know, massive. lead No, no, it's huge. Well, yeah. it's big because, too, I think we view the Lions as the class of the NFC and second place is very much up for debate right now. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. and I have said, well, let me see if the Niners get McCaffrey back because yeah. without McCaffrey, I do not think that they are the second best team in football with him. That offense is completely different, but yeah. we have to see what he looks like. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, I'll go quickly. Bill's Colts is just Moa <laughs> spared you. Um, so, I'm focused again on the Colts offense, which obviously is coming off of a very, very Ooh. performance. Yeah, I'll say. Um, and I, I, I wrote, can you just can you stay out of third and long? Because I think what we yep. saw week one, and I talked about their inability to run the ball and how much the absence of Richardson clearly impacted the run game. But 
earlier in the season, I think a lot of Joe Flacco's success was just on third and long and probably should have been more obviously unsustainable. And then the regression hit pretty hard against Minnesota when he was, he could get anything done on third and long. Um, he's just, their just offense just isn't built for that. And, but and they're not, they're not only not built for that. They're not built for that against the Kansas city chiefs or pardon me against the bills yeah. because the bills are very good at taking away the deep ball. And if you just go three and out, their offense is going to build up a lead and the pass rush is going to tee off. You have to um, put together a more efficient rushing attack. And I would say just, hey, it's why Joe Flacco's here over Anthony Richardson. Just string together completions, man. String together completions. But the run game is something I'll be watching too because, um, you know, the Bills, I think they're not, they're, they're still like shockingly good at run defense given all the injuries. But you have seen offenses that run the football well um, attack them that way. And I, I also just want to see if Indianapolis can improve upon it at all. I think like that's going to be about scheme. They have to figure out a way um, to at least get a little bit closer to what it looked like with Richardson, because right now it looks really bad. Yeah. Four straight games with two or fewer offensive touchdowns for Indianapolis along the lines of that run defense for Buffalo. It's not a mystery why this team just went back and brought or went out and brought two back, brought back two familiar faces in Jordan Phillips and Quentin Jefferson, right? Like uh, that speaks to how bad it's been uh, at times this year on the ground. It's tightened up a little bit for Buffalo recently, but uh, Indianapolis better find a way to disrupt Josh Allen, which has been a real problem. The NFL this season, they have allowed just 11 sacks. Like it's, I tell you what, if you're a young team, and we'll get into this debate as we get closer to the NFL draft, and you're debating the offensive tackle versus wide receiver conversation, um, I think there's a reasonable, if not a very compelling case to make, that the quicker way to get to a high floor is having a better offensive line. The receivers, leave, I think, give you the chance to reach your maximum ceiling. Uh, but as we talk about some of these teams that maybe have some question marks at offensive line, but have a young quarterback in place, Maybe Chicago is a good example of this. Maybe New England will have to adopt this decision themselves if they have to choose between a Travis Hunter or a top offensive tackle. Um, but I feel like Buffalo is a good testament to the fact that, like, you protect your quarterback and the quarterback protects the football. I don't care who you have at wide receiver. It'd be a hard team to get by every week. Yeah, it, it's it's a great point about this Bills offense that, you know, has evolved a lot. I mean, yeah. I was, last week I thought such an – such a mature performance from Gosh, Josh Allen against so the good. Dolphins defense who we're going to talk about. Um, so yeah, I, I am uh, going to take the, uh, the, the chiefs, but okay. wait, no, no, probably. <laughs> we'll get to the Sorry. chiefs in a second. I'll take the chiefs too in that game, but you're taking the bills. I'm like so I am used as well. to taking the chiefs. I just said the chiefs. Sorry. I scrolled down yeah. and scrolled up. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm taking the bills against Joe Flacco. It's going to be very interesting to see when, if it, if the Colts offense doesn't look better, when we start hearing the okay, this has been long enough reckoning. Um, back. Yep. I bet next. next week. Yeah. Okay. Now we're gonna talk about the Chiefs. Sorry, I scrolled down. Let's do it. Yep. Um oh, did I we're both thinking the Niners, I assume. Oh, so I bad. Think, I, thought we, I thought we said that, didn't we? Did we say that? Okay. Sorry. Uh, Guys, there's a lot going on in the world right now. I know. I'm yeah, just there trying is. To there is. Down through yeah. this day. Yeah. Uh, the Broncos and the Chiefs. Yep. Um, this is an interesting one because uh, the Broncos defense has been very, very good. So they're a unique test for anyone, although the Ravens certainly had their way with them. Uh, you are going to be discussing the Broncos side of this. So you go first. Uh, so as we know, the Chiefs do an excellent job of minimizing explosive plays, right? Uh, do the Broncos have a secondary option in the passing game? Cortland Sutton has been better of late, uh, but when he has been a non-factor, um, or when he is a non-factor for this team, I just don't know that there's somebody that can do anything to stress this Chiefs defense. Um, they've got sort of a smorgasbord of wide receivers right now. Marvin Mims and Troy Franklin, the rookie from Oregon, who was playing, and like Adam Troutman's like catching touchdowns, and like Lucas Kroll, and like insert random tight end has like made some plays for Denver. Um, I just don't know if they like. Last week, the minute the Ravens went up by like 10 points, it was like, yeah, all right, this one's over, right? So yeah. Denver just, they need to play a very specific style of offense. I don't know that they have the horses, no pun intended, uh, to keep up with Kansas City. So that, especially if Cortland Sutton is neutralized by whoever the Chiefs deploy on him. Yeah, I uh, I don't love this matchup for the Broncos offense. Uh, I think about this Chiefs defense that presses and blitzes and they're so sticky and they're so stout in run defense. And I just think back to some of the more underwhelming Broncos offensive performances this season and 
that's something that they've struggled with. Teams that are willing to just like, you know, play top, play uh, closer to the line of scrimmage, pardon me, force Bo Nix to throw the ball downfield. It's been tough. I'm more hopeful for them on defense, though, of making this interesting. I know that they're coming off of a very difficult performance against um, Baltimore, uh, but uh, I actually, I, I think we're going to see something different this week, specifically okay. um, against Baltimore. The Broncos played a ton of zone coverage. I think mm-hmm. that was just, I mean, Lamar's, it's such a unique, right, offense with yeah. Lamar as a threat to take yeah. off. Right, exactly. And um, and it, they did a lot of good things, but ultimately it was the, the Ravens offense was a bad matchup for them. I wouldn't be surprised if against the chiefs, they flip back to playing more man coverage as they've been all year, um, watching the chiefs offense on Monday field and with DeAndre Hopkins fully integrated, they were just carving out the zone, the yeah. Bucks zone coverage, yeah. right. With yeah. DeAndre and Kelsey. I think you have a much better chance if you man those guys up. Now totally. you're going to pay for it at times. Holmes is probably going to scramble. It, it it's fine, yeah. but you have to play that variance. I think against this offense because of the weapons that they have right now. Yeah, yeah. I guess the only fee, like the only way that 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 plan blows up in your face is if Xavier Worthy hits, you know, a long one. But like, man, I'm okay with that. I live with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm down, like, great. Right? Throw yeah. downfield. I'd yeah. rather them throw downfield to Worthy than. Then maybe famous last words, watch, I have Worthy on my dynasty team, watch him go for like, you know, a hundred yards and I'll feel great. But I'd rather live with that than just get meticulously dissected with DeAndre Hopkins. Totally, yeah. Which, by the way, like that's going to be the story is like, you know, which of these two teams that has been largely meticulous moving the football this year is going to be better, right? Like Bo Nix, unsurprisingly, amongst the lowest yards per attempt amongst all starting quarterbacks in the NFL and the Chiefs, you know, so much of their offense right now is clock killing Kareem yeah. Hunt, right? It's just like right. chew up yards. Like he's rushing for like 3.9 yards per carry in some games. And that's fine because yeah. the defense is so good that their mindset is like, let's get to 20 and we'll probably win. That's how good the defense is right now. Yeah, that offense has just been squeezing the life out of defenses, oh like just God. slowly putting together these like, you know, hyper efficient drives. So if I'm Denver, I really try to just challenge them and force them to win. And and I'm okay with some explosives. It's yeah. funny. Um, even if Worthy hasn't been catching footballs, he still commands a ton yeah. of respect. And I dare them to make us pay for it. And I, I listen, it might blow up. I, this could age terribly. I'm picking the Chiefs. <laughs> but oh, yeah, God, we're all the way through on every single pick is the same. Um, I will agree. This is going to sound a little silly again. It might almost sound like cliche coach speak, um, but I believe this. You know, I've, I've seen, I saw um, someone sent me the link to a, a stat from Pro Football Reference about how the Chiefs have the lowest point differential of any eight node team in NFL history by like a lot. On the one hand, that might suggest to you like this is a good team, but not a great team. I also believe it underscores a point that I don't exactly know how to quantify it, but I do believe it. The Chiefs know how to win football games when like big moments, Arise, a lot of teams melt. The Chiefs seem to maintain like a relatively stoic demeanor. And it's kind of like, oh yeah, we got this. Like, well, as long as we're, you know, as long as the clock does not have zero seconds left, like we'll find a way. And during this 14 game winning streak, it feels like every game, I I, I, I can't imagine they're covering often are the Chiefs, but they still win. It's just what they do. They're like the boogeyman at some point, the AFC. More if they that. if they win this at some point, I'm going to talk about whether undefeated is on the table because I haven't. I've been. I think Buffalo it. next week is the big test, and then I think it becomes a little bit more of a real conversation. All right, let's take a yeah. quick break. Come back. We've got a couple of pretty good games left. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. All right, we're back. I said we had some good games coming. (laughs) Vikings-Jaguars is not one of them. That's why you're the only person talking about it. Uh, Field, what is your key for... uh, this uh, very exciting Minnesota Jacksonville match. Uh, yeah, I'll make it more Jacksonville focused. This is one of those where, like, if Minnesota shows up in their usual form, they should win the game. Uh, as of right now, we don't know who's going to be starting at quarterback for the Jaguars. As Trevor Lawrence is now dealing with a left shoulder issue, let's assume it is him. 
Uh, totally missed team, that. Yeah, he's got a shoulder issue. They signed C.J. Beathard off of the Dolphins practice squad. Mac Jones would be the starter, if not Trevor Lawrence. But um, is this team going to take the first half seriously? Jacksonville, they've fallen down. They've fallen behind by 10 or more points in the last four games. Uh, they were able to overcome uh, that deficit against the Patriots, obviously an inferior team over in London. But otherwise, they've they've lost, right? Because this team just does not for some reason, ever put a full 60 minutes together. And that's just not going to work against Minnesota. I'll keep it rel- relatively quick. Like, uh, and I, I uh, talked about this during the off season and I know that some people were not the biggest fans of it, but I felt strongly that like Jacksonville, one of their biggest like uh, adjustments this year would be the play better adjustment. Because when you looked at that roster coming <laughs> into this season, it was like, I, I, there are certainly some holes, but it wasn't um, as bad. There weren't as many holes as the as a record uh, down the stretch last year suggested, right? It was like, let's just be responsible and take care of business and we could be a lot better. Uh, they have been much worse this year coming into the season. But as I go and I look at this roster, like if you were to ask me like above average level players, they are not like one of the five worst rosters in the NFL in that regard. Yeah. They just never talent maximize for whatever reason, dating back to their basically bye week of last year. So uh, if they start slow, you might as well just kiss this game goodbye and expect, uh, you know, begin your preparation for whoever they play in week 11. Yeah. I mean, if it's a backup quarterback against this Vikings defense, yeah, goodbye. Uh, yeah. not watching it. But um, I, I guess the only thing I would say that might be of – might make this interesting for Jacksonville, assuming Lawrence plays. Yeah. Um, you know, the Vikings offensive line, and you saw yeah. this a little bit against Indianapolis. They're not, obviously, the loss of Darisau looms large. Interestingly enough, they traded for Cam Robinson with Jacksonville. So there's a little bit of Cam Robinson revenge game. I don't know. But, um, you know, you get, might get a little bit of Josh Hines Allen on Robinson action in this one and that pass rush I feel like is going to have to have a huge day for them to have a chance because that pass defense against Justin Jefferson Jordan Addison TJ Hawkinson welcome back TJ Hawkinson by the way I have have just such a massive addition to that offense totally um that's big I got Jacksonville in this or probably you know you know (laughs) I'm thinking Minnesota oh my gosh my brain I assume you are as well I am, yes. We okay. are in lockstep. This is getting a little bit annoying. No, no. We got, this is a good game. Steelers okay. Commanders. Yeah. I genuinely, I actually haven't decided who I'm going to pick. Ooh, okay, good. I'm going to pin in it. And I thought, let's have this conversation because I, this is a great game. Yeah, this is, it is a great game. Is this the best game, would you say, of the week? <sighs> Certainly. Lions Texans lost a little bit of luster for yeah, me. Yeah, I was going to say Lions Texans. If there's no Nico Collins, who know it doesn't feel quite as enticing to me. Um, yeah, this is the best game of the weekend. Yeah, this is because you've got two forces that um, seem like unique matchups for each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, let me talk about the my side. I'm not on the Commanders. Okay. Yep. I'm talking about the Commanders. Yeah. Um. So the key I came up with with the Commanders is they got to figure out this is really true of anyone who plays the Steelers, but they got to figure out a way to mitigate pressure. Yeah. Um, and there's some things that I think, you know, would work in that regard. Um, the Steelers defense is very, very good at getting after quarterbacks, obviously, but mm-hmm. uh, they are not very good against quick game. Their numbers fall off precipitously when quarterbacks get the ball out quick and go after that second level of the defense in particular. They also struggle versus quarterbacks on the move. Again, it, when quarterbacks are in the pocket, they're like best in the NFL near the top. Once quarterbacks break contain, whether it's by design or just uh, with the scrambling, uh, they become a bottom 10 pass defense. So those are both things that we know Jaden Daniels can do. He can play quickly and he can throw on the move very well. Um, But the thing that I'm so interested in this one, one of the things that I'm interested in, speaking of like strength on strength, right? So we know this Washington Commanders offense loves no huddle. They dramatically outpace the rest of the NFL in going no huddle with Daniels. Daniels has... Uh, 100 attempts in no huddle. He's thrown for over 1,200 yards, both NFL highs. This year's defense has been the best defense in the NFL this year versus no huddle offense. Mm, They are first in EPA per play. So I am just, that's not, like, I'm not saying advocating for commanders to do it less because they're very good at it. I'm just interested in seeing how that plays out because that is a really, really great matchup. It's such a great matchup in so many different ways. There are just a million ways to slice this. The Steelers defense has been so great in just uh, and just like limitless different ways. By the way, they seem like they got a little bit better too with the Preston Smith trade, which this is not, it's not 
this like major impact play. There's a reason why Preston Smith was available. There's also a reason why Preston Smith took a significant pay cut in recent years, right? Like I'm not trying to assume that they are trading for the Preston Smith that once played for the commanders and then was dominant for the Packers, but still it can't hurt as a depth level rusher. You could do a whole lot worse than that. Uh, Washington has slowed down in terms of finishing drives recently. 0 for three in the red zone against the bears a couple of weeks ago, just three for six last week against the giants. Uh, and they came on hot in the first half. You got to finish drives, though, not because this game I expect to be super high scoring. Uh, it's just the difference, though, for a Pittsburgh team that we were talking earlier about how the Chiefs kind of like suck the life out of opposing teams. The Steelers defense does that as well for the most part. Uh, this is a, interestingly enough, like 44 and a half. It's not a massive over under, Mina. It's the highest over under for any Steelers game yet this season. That number could change a bit because they have not exactly played a bunch of high flying offenses, but I do think red zone defense is going to be the way that this game is decided uh, because, like, the commanders are going to move the football against basically anybody. Uh, Jaden Daniels, any dual threat quarterback, is going to present a matchup problem, but one who is so proficient both as a runner and as a thrower, as Jaden obviously is, is going to, like, they're just going to move the football. They are going to do that. But if they can finish drives, it's going to be really hard, in my opinion, for Pittsburgh to keep up. They got to come with a good plan for uh, Daniels as a runner, not a, a design runner. I'm talking about yep. the scrambles, especially um, if they play man coverage as they play a fair amount, turning their backs on him. Somebody's yep. got to have eyes on him. Um, the other side of the ball is interesting because uh, both of these teams traded for players who yeah. are going to be impactful i just don't know how soon the yeah. sealers traded for mike williams to add to their receiving core doubling down on bombs away outside the numbers yep and then the commanders traded for um marshawn Lattimore, who i don't i i tried to find his status generally because he was injured obviously you know didn't play in, in new orleans so uh sounds like he'll give it a go yeah so but i kind of think he plays is different we'll see i kind of think both these guys play which makes yeah. this really because because we know what we know what Pittsburgh wants to do to this team. They want to run the ball and they want to play action and they want to throw outside the numbers deep. It's what they want to do in every game. And those are all things like the commanders have not been very good at stopping. So I actually think like, okay, are we going to see how, are we going to quickly see why they did this trade? I'm very intrigued by that. Yeah. By the way, Dan Quinn though, I know that the commander's defense has been less of the story, but Dan Quinn is up to his Dan Quinn stuff of late. This defense is soaring uh, relative to where it was earlier better, on in the yeah. season. Much, much better. No surprise. Well, they have some serious, or they had some serious cornerback limitations prior to the Marshawn Lattimore trade. They've got some legitimate veterans uh, that they signed in free agency this offseason to beef up the front seven. And they've done this a lot without Jonathan Allen, but between Lawrence Armstrong and Bobby Wagner. Like we have seen this defense take much more of the form that I think they envisioned this offseason. Johnny Newton, by the way, their second round pick coming on as well in a major, major way. Love to see that. Okay. Who are you taking in this one? Uh, I am going to take the commanders because they're playing at home. <sighs> I was going to take the commanders too. Mm. Uh, God, I can take the Steelers. So just to, to yeah, no, I know. I know. I wrote my picks down beforehand, so I'm holding myself accountable, but I also don't want to be totally in unison. I think we see the game come somewhat comparably. Yeah, and I think we both see it as being pretty close. Yeah, this I feels think, like the most competitive game that I've looked at so far. I feel like the commander's offense is more um, consistent than the Steelers' offense, but then the Steelers' defense is more certainly more consistent than the commander's defense. So it's yeah. like, ah, you know, like the two stronger units are facing off and the right. two slightly weaker units are facing off. Um, I think I'm going to go commanders as well, though. I got to be honest. I'm not going to split it just to split it. I just, I just don't. Yeah. I, I like that offense. I think the best out of when I think about these matchups. Um, all right. Perfect Ty timing though, by the way, I did just see that, uh, Marshall Lattimore was a DNP for the commanders okay. day one because of a hamstring injury. So just table, if, if he doesn't play on, on Sunday, uh, just understand that we at this time yeah. do not know for sure one way or the other. Titans Chargers is you. Oh, man, this is a fun one right here. Um, so the uh, this one comes down to whether the Chargers can get out of their, uh, the, the Titans can get out of their own way. Um, the Titans have the second worst turnover margin in the NFL this year. It's negative eleven. They might have the worst special teams in the NFL this season. We saw the Lions a couple of weeks ago just return kick after kick after kick against them um, with very little in the way of resistance from. Uh, the Titans special teams coverage units. Meanwhile, the Chargers are kind of the antithesis. Like 
they just don't beat themselves. They're playing excellent defense. They have a plus nine turnover margin. They have the fewest penalty yards this season. Yeah. I think the second fewest total penalties this season. No surprise, a Jim Harbaugh-led team is just insanely disciplined. But I think the only way the Titans win this game is if the Chargers barf down their leg and just like, there's there's, there's just nothing here. Like, it's yeah. a complete unchargers like performance. I don't know, Locke sounds a little bit strong, but this is closest to my, this is one of my, uh, like, if I, if I were still alive in a survivor pool right now, I'd have a hard time not making my pick the Chargers this weekend. Yeah, I... I got to give some love to the charge defense because I have not talked about it other than oh, just gosh. being like, wow, they're a lot better this year. Yeah. I mean, first of all, they're first in EPA per play right now after Denver's yeah. performance against Baltimore, second in success rate. Um, when I watch them, I'm just struck by how few mistakes they're making. Yeah. They're, you know, like they don't have an elite pass rush. I mean, Cleo Max is still great, but you know, they're, they're not, I would not put them up there with the best pass rushes in the NFL, but they all play together really well. They seem like you never see, let me put it this way. You never see them like fooled by misdirect. You, you do sometimes, but I'm just saying like, yeah, really, really on top of a lot of the stuff that the better offenses are doing in the NFL right now. So they're super impressive. Also, I got to love them. My guy Puna Ford having like a yeah. renaissance there. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm also taking the chargers in this. I think yeah. that. Damn. That is the uh, the best the best unit in this football game. Um, okay, just me on Falcons Saints. Uh, who, buddy? Saints. Okay, so I came up with the one thing I thought that the Saints could do to make this close because obviously the Falcons are favored. The Falcons are now looking like the favorites to win the division with some yep. of the Bucks losses. Um, and and one thing I, I I wanted to note was that so the Saints defense has been very very bad. But the Falcons' defense has also struggled. For, so both of these teams are outside zone running teams, right? And they, they they love to do it. Weirdly, I was actually surprised by this. The Falcons' defense has actually been worse in success rate versus outside zone yeah. than the Saints' defense. So there is a world in which Alvin Kamara gets going on the ground. I mean, I do not trust this Falcons' defense one bit. I Love yeah. the offense. I think the offense will have a ton of success in this one. I am picking the Falcons to win because of that. But this Falcons defense, uh, not that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they are not that good. They have a major, major edge problem. I did not realize it was that dramatic uh, against outside zone. Um, and not that that is exclusively limited to the edge players. But, uh, you know, certainly the edge players are fairly fundamental Hard, yeah. to your uh, run defense on a, a facing outside zone run. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a decision that, um, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and criticize the Falcons for being seven and three right now, six and three right now, seven and two, whatever they are, six and three. Gosh, I, I need to study the standings more apparently they are six and three my apologies so two is. games up uh in the division right they are six they're, yeah. they're legitimately a, a you know a very strong contender for the division you just wonder this always comes down to like what the floor versus what the ceiling will be for this team and it feels like the ceiling could have been even higher if they had one more defensive reinforcement available for them um there's like only one thing and this is so anecdotal and it like feels almost like fanboyish to bring up um the only thing that like has me at all curious about how the Saints perform is they make a coaching change. They trade away one of their best players and Marshawn Lattimore. Does this team come out with a chip on its shoulder or does this team come out and they're just the like, fire one, coach three, bounce. Yeah, that's a, oh, oh, again, the thing. I don't like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I know. I'm, but it's, and it's the one team. team they hate more than anybody else, right? This is their biggest rival. It's like maybe the most spirited rivalry in the entire sport. These guys hate each other. It's not like, whatever, Ohio State, Michigan or something. But it's one of those where, like, you can throw the records out, right? Uh, I'm not totally convinced it's a real thing. Uh, but if this game is tight in the third quarter, like, that's going to be the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, I... I'm still picking the Saints, to be clear. Yeah, I'm still I picking know. the Falcons, to be clear. I, I, no, yeah. I'm with you. I don't like I don't like when teams fire their coaches getting close to those games. Just, yeah, you know, so. yeah. Um, Falcons are the better team, though, so we'll yep. see. Um, okay, Jets-Cardinals. The Jets... Coming off of a win. This one, I think, I actually don't know who's favored because this is probably one of the closer games. It is. I'll tell you right now. Um, so. All right. It is the uh, – it's it's in Arizona. The Jets are half-point favored. Wow. Speaks to how close this one is. Yeah. Do we agree with that? Uh, I, I Without sparing the pick. I, I do not. Um, yeah. without okay, well, see, you're pick, Jets. Yeah. I'm Cardinals. Yeah. Uh – you go first. Uh, the Jets got to be able to find a way to protect from different angles offensively uh, this week. The, Char uh, the Cardinals, 
I don't know that they have a singular dominant rusher. Uh, they lost Dennis Gardick a couple weeks ago. Was that like maybe two or three weeks ago to, I believe, a torn ACL? And he's like hair on fire defensive player that just like finds ways to constantly bother quarterbacks. Yeah, um, underrated. And they just keep getting the job done. This past week against the Bears, they were totally under siege. Um, this defense, coordinated by Nick Rallis, Jonathan Gannon obviously involved as well. They attack from every single angle. And we know the Jets' protection plan has been suspect at times this season. Aaron Rodgers is playing in a much tighter circle this year because he's almost 40 and he's still coming off of an Achilles tear about a year, I don't know, 14 months ago. Like, has not looked, at least to me, the same athletically. Uh, the Charger, the Cardinals are going to mix things up. They're going to confuse you. And they're pretty capable of doing it. They've just got a lot of, like, again, there's no dominant rusher. Their first-round pick, Darius Robinson, might get to that level, but he still hasn't even played in, like, yeah, since week one, maybe not at all. Anyways, the bottom line is that they can get after it with a bunch of different guys, a lot of athletes on this Cardinals team as well. Traded for Baron Browning, also. Yeah, um, yeah. The tape, the the Bears game. I was really struck by how many different ways they got after it in terms Something of like twelve different guys had a pressure for them, and Something they were ridiculous. like really some really funny ones they kept yeah. saying like dbs and linebackers just like jumping <laughs> over the line of scrimmage. Yes. um but the bears the offensive line which has obviously just been a problem for them all year but they just had no clue where pressure right. was coming from it felt like yep. um so that's massive this jets offense has struggled with pressure uh rogers has struggled against the blitz and when you take him off of his first read his accuracy numbers just plummet this year because he's so, when he's uncomfortable he's just not his himself um i think that they're going to try to play fast and to mitigate that. And yep. I think the, the, I actually think the Jets offense will have success in doing so because this Cardinals defense is still very vulnerable. Yep. Um, my side, I, I want to focus on the Cardinals offense, though. They should be able to run on this Jets defense. I mean, coming off of that Paris game, whoo, 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 yeah. James Conner. Uh, so on runs between the tackles, the Cardinals run a ton of duo, by the way. They are third in EPA per play. They're averaging 5.6 yards per carry. The Jets' defense versus runs between the tackles, 29th in EPA per play. This has been a vulnerability of theirs all year long. And if I'm Arizona, I am perfectly content just grinding this one out on the ground because that's your biggest advantage. Yeah, man. They And last week, three separate running backs found uh, – excuse me, two of them found the end zone, neither of which was James Conner. You got some depth, man. Yeah, I just like James Conner manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tip of the cap to James Conner, though, just for – he's just so damn tough, man, and yeah. has played in every game this season. The Cardinals have a diverse, fun running game. Um, yeah, that team, I, I give them a ton of credit. They kind of weather some early storms, um, and they've really found that identity on both sides of the ball, I would say. It's it's, it's impressive. Let's split here. I, I, it sounds like you're taking the Cardinals. Yeah. Oh, I am yes. at home. I think this is going to be close. Because- it's a momentum game for the Jets. Like they win this one. And, and I know that like, it's one of America's often like least favorite topics because it feels like we are over indexed on the Jets. But if they win and a couple the Bengals lose tomorrow night, the Jets win and like the Colts lose, like the, the Jets are like right there, like a half game out of the seventh oh, spot. The AFC. I know, I know, I know. AFC. Now, if they lose and a couple other things happen, we could be talking about them as like, hey, what draft pick should the Jets be targeting? I know. Right it feels like this one, this season could go in so many different directions. It um, does. Yep. I like, I just, I like Rodgers against the Cardinals defense. So, yep. but I do think, like I said, the Cardinals can have success on the ground. Um, okay. Eagles Cowboys is just me because yep. we are getting Cooper Rush. Yay. Sweet. Yay. Uh, I went back. And looked at the 2022 game log just to kind of think through, like, what did Cooper Rush do well? Why did they win those games? Yep. And what uh, he did well was played with the best pass defense in football. Yeah, I know. (laughs) uh, In those games, I mean, the defense was incredible. They had 22 sacks, uh, which is the most in the league. They were top three in most metrics. They got after it. Oh, boy. Um, it wasn't really – I mean, Rush was fine. He took care of the ball reasonably well in some of the games. They ran the ball okay. Obviously, they had more weapons back then, and the offensive line was better. Now yeah. he's in worse circumstances. I don't have a lot of faith in him. I think for the Cowboys to have a chance in this one, they really have to get after Hurts. Um, not clear what Michael Parsons' status is. I just checked. Limited. Is yeah, it's like he's got a definitely. chance, but definitely not a guarantee. Well, if he plays, he could make it interesting. If he doesn't, I don't foresee this one being very interesting. I'm picking the Eagles regardless. What's okay. it you? Um, I am picking the Eagles, by the way. Yeah, sorry. I know we're in unison except for one pick, but yeah, the Eagles. Take care of business. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sunday Night Football. Yeah, it's fun. <sighs> Lions, Texans. Yeah. 
Texas. What a good one. You take you. So you're doing the Lions. Yep. What do you got? Well, the problem is that the key is not quite as obvious because I don't know if he's going to play. Um, the Texans' life on offense has completely changed because they have zero sudden change opportunities right now without Nico Collins. Um, obviously, when you when you score a touchdown, it's a good thing, whether it's from a yard out or 75 yards out, but it totally flips. I think it like takes the wind out of the sails of a defense when you have a 75-yard touchdown. It's just demoralizing. Uh, if you look at the Lions statistically this year in the past game on defense, the numbers might look pretty bad, Worth noting that they play with the lead all the time. So some of that is just like compiling by opposing teams. But I don't like this is still a secondary that like we've seen some real struggles for Terry and Arnold, their first round pick and some real growth pains like Carlton Davis, a guy who's been like an up and down player. There's a reason why Tampa, who is bad on defense this year, was willing to trade him to a team in the conference that they think probably was one of their competitors. Right. Um, but if Nico's out. That, that just like it, it's going to be trying to grind the crap out of the ball on the ground and the Lions have been a great run defense. That's not the way to do it. Collins is so important. I mean, we obviously have proof of that now. We've yeah. seen it how what this offense looks, but he's so important because um, you know TJ TJ Stroud is just facing so much quick pressure, so many quick hits, and oh, while this Lions pass rush, they just traded for Zedaria Smith. Talked about that earlier this week. Um, you know, the edge is not a strength. You know what there is a strength of theirs is that interior, man. Olin McNeil, 10th mm. in pass rush win, Gosh. has been getting after it, and the interior of this Texans offense line is a nightmare for Stroud. I mean, yeah. I just, the amount of unblocked just dudes immediately breaking through on the inside is really upsetting. Yeah. Um, so they can't fix the offensive line, but getting Collins back, he's been such an outlet for Stroud under pressure, um, working in the middle of the field. So that's huge. I agree with you. Like that is, I'm not saying it's if he plays, they win, but it certainly makes this game a lot more interesting. The other person I would put pressure on, I suppose, is Bobby Slowak. He has to find a way to mitigate some of this pressure. I mean, there's things that I think they could do. I would put Stroud on the move more deliberately rather than him just escaping. He's so good throwing on the move. Um, You know, they've had some success with no huddle as well. I, but point is like what this offense has looked like the last few weeks if it looks like that in this game they're not going to win yeah it's they got no chance i mean the lions right now the, the chiefs i have a hard time saying they're not the best team because they're eight no and they've deserved it but uh, i believe the lions fastball is faster than anybody else's fastball right now if that makes sense yeah uh, they're good at home they're good on the road they don't care where they're playing they can beat you in a million different ways on offense the defense has really weathered the storm like i'm not saying they've been as good without aiden hutchinson but everybody keeps talking about like they need to trade for somebody, which they did in Zedaria Smith. But it's not like this defense like fell off a cliff without Agent Hutchinson. They've still been very respectable. So uh, until further notice, I'm picking the Lions like pretty much in every game. I am also picking the Lions. I do want to address the other side of the ball quickly because yeah. the Texan defense is very good and they're very good against the run. They're good yeah. at defending the middle of the field. So this isn't like an easy day at the off. And they, they have, of course, one of the best pass rushes in football. Um, Will Anderson Jr. is the other name on the injury yeah, list. We're all watching. Yeah, very nervous about that one. Uh, again, yeah. I would feel a lot better about that side of the ball if he was playing. Yeah. Um, it's still a good pass rush, but, you know, the, the Texans are just undermanned right now. Yeah, they are. I mean, they have better depth. They have some depth at, at edge. That's been a, an area they've actually done a nice job with. But, man, uh, no, Will Anderson is uh, – that's, that's super – I mean, that's – not crippling to the defense, but it's it's a big blow. He has been awesome this season, and uh, those tackles in Detroit, uh, not bad themselves. Keep an eye yeah. on the uh, injury list for this game because yeah. it's I'm trying to figure it out right now. I couldn't. I find know. It, I, I looked up. No, I, I didn't like, see it. Yeah, I just saw yeah. limited or something. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's out there yet. Yeah. Um, this is one that's probably gonna go down to the especially the Sunday night game. You know. Yep. Um, even if those guys play, I'm still gonna take the Lions. I just Same. think the Lions are such a wagon right now. Yeah, but if they awesome. do play. I think there's my, I, I think there's a good chance this Texas offense looks a lot better totally. than it has in recent yeah. weeks. 100%. Uh, it's been, it's been rough. Yep. All right. Monday night football. We end here. Dolphins Rams. Um, this, I, at the top, I said, this felt like a must win for the, the, the Bengals and the Dolphins were the two teams I was thinking about where it's like, all right, what you're you done. If you don't yeah. Win. You gotta win. Yeah. <laughs> Dolphins, interestingly, I thought um, not sellers at the deadline. I was, 
I'm sure a lot of teams call it about Calais Campbell, for example. Yep. Um, yep. He is still a dolphin, so they are still trying to win. Um, facing off with a Rams team that's kind of back from the dead, seemingly now that they're healthy again. Uh, so I'm doing the LA side. You're doing the Miami side. You mm-hmm. go first. Uh, can they perhaps protect against this Rams defensive front that all of a sudden looks like the Florida State defense from last year? You know why? Because they have two players from Florida State last year that they used their first two picks on, and these guys can't be blocked right now. Uh, what a joy it is to watch Braden Fisk do exactly what he did down the stretch last season. Uh, you go back to, like, he had kind of a slow start to his tenure uh, at Florida State, did Braden Fisk, and then he had three sacks against Louisville in the ACC championship game. Like, he had six sacks over the final, like, four games of the season. He looks exactly like he did at that time at Florida State. Jared Verse is just as advertised. Their pressure rate has been ridiculous over the past three to four weeks. Uh, and they they need it, right? They're, they're a shorthanded team in several areas on that defense. Like but that, yeah. you can mask some of those limitations at cornerback with these guys rushing like they have. And Miami, I mean, this has been a problem for Miami for years now. The offensive line and the health of the offensive line. Um, but... You know, we t- I talked earlier about second reaction plays for quarterbacks. Now, I, I really believe that decision-making accuracy and second re- reaction capability are now the three most important traits for a quarterback in the NFL. That's not a real area of strength for Tua, right? This is not a, r- a running quarterback. And so much of what they do is like on, on you know, on time and within rhythm because they have a brilliantly dis- designed offense. Uh, but if you can't protect or if they're rushing with great efficiency, it's going to be a real problem for a Miami team that needs to find explosive plays as well. They thrived off of that. Yeah. Uh, but they're not, I mean, Tyreek Hill has become a ghost this year relative to what we have known Tyreek Hill to be. Yeah. The, I think the Dolphins, it, it, Offense, they have an advantage as long as that ball comes out in less than 2.25 seconds, which yeah. Tua Tagovailoa, so it often does. Um, because in the passing game, like the Rams defense are very, very good at getting pressure, but behind those pass rushers, you can really attack them with play action, with misdirection. They're giving up a ton of yards after the catch. So for Miami, it really, I think it comes down to like, I, for McDaniel, like the creativity of the pass game, finding ways to get the ball out of Tua's hands quickly getting the ball to your playmakers in space. Um, I say this every week, but I'm telling you, Devon Achan pass game. I like against this team in particular, these linebackers. Uh, I'm focused on the other side of the ball because I think for the Rams, um, the the offense, which you know had some ups and downs last week against Seattle, there's an opportunity here for them to look a little bit more like they did the week before. Yeah. Uh, this Dolphins defense is interesting field because um, – they are actually like they rate pretty decently in a lot of metrics. They're 11th in success rate. They're 18th yeah. in EPA, but they're near the bottom of the NFL in DVOA, which is just for opponents. So I went back and looked at the quarterbacks they faced, and it was Trevor Lawrence, Geno, Week One. Geno had a ton of success against them. Then they had uh, Will Levis, Mason Rudolph, Jacoby Brissett, Anthony Richardson. <sighs> Kyler Murray. It's been they, bad. Yeah. It's, and then they faced Josh Allen twice, who had a ton of success against them last week. Murray also had a lot of success. So basically, they've right. feasted uh, on bad right. quarterbacks and then they've lost pretty badly to good quarterbacks. Yeah. Matthew Stafford is a very good quarterback. So yeah. um, I, I think like Stafford through the air, I could see having a lot of success. I think there's players in the secondary that you can pick on. The Bills went after the linebackers in coverage right. pretty aggressively. The key for Miami, I would say, is just getting pressure on Stafford because he has thrown some balls that should have been picked, including against Seattle. And I think that's probably their best chance in this. I would agree. Hey, just a little trivia for you on the way out here. When was the last time Tyree kill caught a pass of over 30 yards? No, week one. Week dude. one, yeah. yeah week one. Wow. And I understand that Tua was out for four games. I'm not naive yeah. to that to that reality. But like back to back games, like um, that that just it's just a fun. He had 29 explosive plays last year in the passing game to Tyreek Hill. He's got six, and we're nearly halfway through the season. So uh, it's now or never for Miami. I, I think it's probably obvious at this point that I am also picking the. Or I am picking the Rams. I think you're probably going that direction as well. Uh, and this Rams team, man, I admire the grit here. Like this team just sort of finds a way. Uh, they're punching a bit above their weight right now for the second straight season, starting slow for the second straight season. But given the oddness of the NFC West, like they might be in the mix come January. You know what? I'm going to flip it and take the Dolphins. Love it. I Backs against the wall. So we talked about those explosives, the Rams defense, third worst DVOA yeah. against deep passes this Ooh. year. 
Um, now, players have gotten healthier, and I think the pass rush has mitigated that to some degree, so that might be a little bit more about the beginning of the season. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if I like the matchup of Mike McDaniel versus the Rams defensive coordinator, Chris Shula. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't love the matchup on the other side of the ball, so I think this could be high scoring, but give me like a surprising Tyree Kill midseason comeback game. Uh, fantasy football guy speaking here from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> I mean, I have Puka. Who, I, the worst possible outcome last week. CS lost to Ann Puka. I know. I I like, punched Tariq, Tariq Willen at halftime. Like, good Lord, oh, people, Lord. what are you doing here? Yeah. Um. All right. Well, that's it for the week. Field, thank you, as always, for joining us. As I mentioned at the top, you guys should obviously check out the Fantasy Fo- Focus show, which you can also watch on YouTube. Yeah. Um, as well, first draft's also Saint both ESPN NFL on YouTube. Yeah, first draft, which drops every Thursday at noon. So we're the, and then uh, focus is every day at ten a.m. for uh, for those that love themselves in fantasy football. We are five <laughs> days a week, baby. Not me lately. Yeah. Um, as always, you can check this show out on YouTube or wherever your pods. Thank you guys for listening today. I know it's absolutely chaotic, insane day that's hitting a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And hopefully, if you're listening to this, it gave you a little bit of escape. I guess unless you're a Titans fan probably didn't give you any escape, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, 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 thank you also, uh, again, as always, to the fine folks at Omaha Productions who work on this show and put it out every week. That would be Kristen Sebecki, Anthony Jimenez, Owen Saylor, Jack Foster, Tucker Tashin, and otherwise, I will see you next week. Wow! Yeah!